Opening your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 11. Chapter 11, we're just going to study the second half of this chapter this morning. And before we read, it's important to remember what we're reading. The Word of God, which according to Psalm 19, has the power to revive souls, to enlighten eyes, to make wise the simple, which is, according to God, more valuable than gold and sweeter than honey. So with that in mind, let's read Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarshish to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Last year, for our anniversary, I took my wife uh, to the Pacific Museum of, of the Pacific Theater of World War II. Uh, just a little bit south of here. That might seem like a really strange place to take your wife on the anniversary, but my wife loves history. Uh, she loves that era in history. She studied it extensively. And I felt like she would be thrilled, actually, on an anniversary trip to spend part of the day just wandering around the museum, watching the exhibits and seeing some of the newsreels and so forth. And we were not disappointed. It really was a fantastic time. And, and one of the moments in that museum that stood out to me is their motto. They have a, a motto for the museum. If you go to their website, they have a motto right at the top banner of the page. And their motto is, remembering our heroes to inspire our youth. Remembering our heroes to inspire our youth. And if you walk through the museum, you really do feel the effectiveness of their fulfilling that goal. Because you, you can't help but be inspired. You're hearing about sacrifice and the effort and coordination and countrywide mobilization trying to defeat an enemy. And you can't help but be inspired by people who give themselves in this way in service to their country. I think Luke would like that motto, because I think Luke writes this second half of chapter 11, and in many ways, the entire book of Acts to accomplish the same thing. He wants to remember our heritage and our heroes in order to inspire our future. That's what he wants to do. He wants us to look backward so we can look forward with greater passion, and, and we need that. We need that all the time, but I think as a, as a pastor of this church, I, I think we need that especially in this season of life in the church, and here's why. When you first plant a church, which we did now four years ago, there is this sort of newness adrenaline. 
There's a kind of a newness and excitement about something new starting and launching, something that has never been there before, and there's something uh, sort of thrilling about being a part of that. But as the years pass, it is easy for Christians to become familiar with the marvelous and majestic work God is doing in building his church. It's easy to, to take it for granted. It's easy to just get into the motions and to lose something of that passion, that inspiration, and, and to forget about the heritage that we have of God building his church. I, I experienced that. I'm sure you experienced that. There's a sort of a fading from our minds and our souls that ignited passion with what God is doing in the earth, building his church. Well, Luke doesn't want that to happen to the early church. And so he wrote this history of the earliest church to the church perhaps several decades later, reading this, his hope is as they tour through the halls of their own history, they will be inspired with fresh passion because they need to be freshly inspired. The foundation, as it were, has been laid by the earliest church, and then Luke's audience needs fresh passion by touring through the halls of their heroes. And this passage is no exception. Now, we don't uh, have a lot of familiarity with these names, Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Maybe some of them are familiar. But for a, a, a Christian reading uh, this, maybe three decades later, the name Antioch would certainly jump out at them. Because Antioch was a primary mission base for the earliest church. It's where Paul went on his famous missionary journeys around the Mediterranean world. So when, when, when you read, some of them went to Antioch, it, it would be a little bit like us reading a story about people that traveled across the ocean and they came to Plymouth Rock or they came to Jamestown, or Columbus set off on his voyage. It would jump out at you because you see yourself in that history. That town is crucial. It's important. And this is how it got started. This base of missionary activity around the Mediterranean world, this is how it began. Luke's point, I think, in this passage is that the heritage of the church must inspire fresh passion to build the church today. The heritage of the early church must inspire fresh passion to build the church today. We need the motivation that comes from learning from this heritage, from looking back to our own history and seeing how this mighty church in Antioch was built. Now, three marks of this heritage we're going to look at as we try to feel the effect of Luke walking through how this church was established. Three marks of our heritage in the planting of the church in Antioch. The first mark, evangelism. The first mark, notice in verse 19, notice what it says. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch and notice the primary description of what they were doing while they ran away from the intense persecution they were experiencing in Jerusalem. What were they doing? They traveled far, but what were they doing? They were speaking the word. They were speaking the word. The word preached, the name of Jesus proclaimed, is the description of their lifestyle. Luke finds very little else important about them. This is the most important thing about what they were doing when they ran away from the persecution, understandably, in Jerusalem. And notice his accent, actually, is on those who went even beyond the cultural boundaries. Many of them spoke only to Jews, not necessarily a bad thing, but the accent is on those who took the step of preaching to Greek-speaking Jews, those of a very different cultural background. Same ethnicity, different language and cultural background, the Hellenists in verse 20, and they also were preaching the Lord Jesus. They were speaking the word, they were preaching the Lord Jesus. And notice the result of this evangelistic activity. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So what happened? Stephen, the great leader in the early church, the passionate evangelist, was martyred. We remember the story from just a few chapters before. 
A great persecution takes place. Christians are in danger, and they begin to move away from Jerusalem because there is a threat to their life. And as they are scattered by that persecution, notice what they do. Very important to see what they do. They do not remain silent. Now, they, they run away. They're not masochists. They don't see something good in dying by itself. They do evade their capture and destruction and so forth. But what they will not do is be silent in the hope that it will protect their comfort. Well, let's move from Jerusalem, and we'll keep our new Christian identity a secret as we move into Cyprus and Serene and Antioch. They move into Antioch. You can imagine the normal experience. They move into a new community. It's a new town, new neighbors. There's a new guy at the fish market. There's a new person to buy the red dye from. There's new people to know. And what do they immediately begin to do to those new people? It's not a question to pass over lightly. They don't remain silent. They don't simply speak to them in their native tongue and say, isn't it a wonderful day today and what's the price of fish? They move the conversation to what has transfixed their lives, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jews are speaking to Jews. Hellenistic Jews are speaking to Hellenistic Jews. The accent is on the gospel going beyond the borders of merely cultural Jews and into non-cultural Jews, the Hellenists itself. And notice, God's perspective is that this is activity worth anointing. The hand of the Lord was with them. Now, brothers and sisters, Redemption Hill Church, we want the hand of the Lord to be with us. Don't you want the hand of the Lord to be with you? Don't you want that? Don't you feel at times when your heart has drifted from the Lord, this desire that the hand of the Lord would be with you? What a saying, the hand of the Lord, the mighty hand of the Lord. The Old Testament talked about the outstretched arm of God, this mighty, powerful arm that can work wonders. And this passage says, the hand of the Lord was with these refugee exile Christians when they did something very specific. They spoke the name of of Jesus. Seemingly forgetful that the very reason they had to move to a different city was because the speaking of that name led to persecution. But they would rather have the hand of the Lord with them in the speaking of that name than live in comfort and protecting their own security and their normal life. These are our heroes. These are our heroes. Let's acknowledge that. Let's set that in our soul. Who is your hero, Christian? Well, one of them is right here. The membership of the Church of Antioch. Because in spite of persecution that led to martyrdom, what did they do? They preach the name of Jesus wherever they go. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And it says, many, a great number who believed, turned to the Lord. Evangelism is a crucial mark of our heritage, and it must be a mark of our church as well. We must proclaim the gospel and invite unbelievers to respond. We must reach out to those that do not know him. We must be known by the name of Jesus, whatever the cost. And isn't this such a hard thing to do? Because isn't it easier to be a normal citizen of Antioch than a passionate citizen of heaven? Let's ask ourselves this question. I, I'm, I'm asking myself this question. Let's, let's consider this. Do, you, do we look more like a normal citizen of Round Rock or like a member of the church in Antioch? Do we look more like a normal citizen of Round Rock or Georgetown or Pflugerville or Austin, or more like a member of the Church of Antioch. If we crave the hand of the Lord to be with us, we must be about what the Lord is doing on the earth, and that is saving people who do not know his name. Evangelism. The mark of the early church. Also, an important note. Let, let's just notice what the essence of the church is. What is the essence of what God is doing in the earth? Look at verse 21. 
I just want to turn this around a bit. We're called to witness as they did, but let's also note that, that what happened when the hand of the Lord moved was that a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Just, just a quick side note. We need to remember as Christians that what we did when we were saved was we turned to the Lord. We turn to the Lord. The point I'm making is that there, there is this relational, personal turning to the Lord that is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian at its essence is not living a certain lifestyle or being a little nicer than the guy and lady next door or, or having a certain family life. No, that's not the essence of what it means to be a Christian. The essence of it is to be turned by faith to the Lord. It's to be reconciled to the Lord Jesus as a personal Savior. And we need to remember this not just as witnesses, but as converts first ourselves. This is who you are if you're a Christian. You are one who has been turned to the Lord by his grace. That's who you are. That is your most important identity. There is nothing more important about you than that you have been turned to the Lord by his grace. But that is easy to forget. It's easy to forget. It's easy to let our turning to the Lord become a drifting memory rather than a current passion. The Lord becomes a, a, a sort of way of life instead of a, a personal passion, a, a personal zeal, a personal relational connection. And we forget what we were converted to. We weren't converted to a system. We weren't converted to a religion. We weren't converted to a, a way of family practice. We weren't converted to a certain schooling choice or a certain morality. First and foremost, we were converted to the Lord. That's why we have to tour these halls again and walk down. Yes, that's right. That's who I am. I was turned to the Lord. The heritage of the early church, what's it, what is it desiring to do? It's desiring to inspire fresh passion in the church today. Fresh passion in the building of the church today. Fresh passion in the identity, the self-identity of the church today. Ask yourself a question. In the last week, in the last week, let's just look at the last week. Has your identity, your passion, been seen in this page about the early church? Where you were one who has turned to the Lord and one who bears the name of Jesus. And if not, let's, let's look back at this heritage again. Let's be freshly inspired again. Let's look to our heroes so that it can inspire our future again. Evangelism, both that which we speak and the, that which we remember came to us, is our identity. It is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. We were turned to the Lord and we long to see others turn to the Lord. Evangelism, crucial mark of our heritage. Second mark, teaching. Teaching. Now, probably because of the sheer number of disciples that are turning to the Lord and believing, says a great number in verse 21, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas. Now, we've heard of Barnabas before. He was that encouraging man who sought to connect Paul to a... Uh, uncertain church and having trouble believing his conversion. This is this encouraging man, Barnabas, this leader in the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And notice again the affirmation of God, and a great many people were added to the Lord. It's an important point. Teaching is a part of our heritage as Christians. As Christians who came ultimately from Antioch, because this is your personal heritage, your heritage in all likelihood, it can be traced back to this local church. Because it was from this local church that Paul preached to the entire Mediterranean world. In all likelihood, your conversion traces its story back to here. So this heritage of this church is very personal for you and me. 
Your heritage is a heritage of teaching, teaching sound doctrine. Very important for us to, to see this point because it's possible for us to get excited about evangelism in such a way that we, we feel it's, it's disconnected from growing and maturing in sound doctrine in the church. But this was the burden of the church in Jerusalem. They, they didn't just want to see the church spread out. They wanted to see the church built up. And they didn't believe that new converts were able on their own and using their own discernment to grow in the grace of God and the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again because it's, it's countercultural to say that, I think especially today. The leaders in Jerusalem did not believe that this church could be what it was meant to be apart from wise, statured, sound teaching from a man called to teach. They did not believe that. They did not consider this fledgling church safe or provided for unless sound teaching was provided. And we need to remember that. We need sound teaching to fulfill our heritage. We need it. We need sound teaching. We need sound teaching that will, will help us to do a couple of things. Notice, notice the marks of Barnabas as he teaches. I think it's very helpful, really, for any kind of leader, helpful for parents, but also helpful for pastors or how we think about the teaching of the church. Barnabas has a couple of notable kind of strengths. Notice he says he came and he saw the grace of God and he was glad. I think that's the first mark of any biblical leader, is that they are thrilled to see the grace of God. They, they want to be a spectator of God's grace in the life of the church. A, a biblical teacher is, is not a man who's looking to build his own kingdom or assumes that the church is dependent on him to be established. A biblical teacher is a man who is thrilled at the evidence of God's grace in the church. And that's the foundation of faithful exhortation anyway. You can't exhort if you're not first encouraged by God's grace at work. But really helpful side note uh, for parents. This is a great passage to think about for parents. Now, we're not teachers of the church, but we do teach our children. And, and Barnabas is an excellent example for every dad and every mom. Notice he begins by celebrating the grace of God at work in Antioch. He says, I'm so glad. Now, he had nothing to do with that. But that's irrelevant to him because all he cares about is God's grace working in this young church. He saw the grace of God and he was glad. Now, now that's a good model for all parents and certainly for any pastor or leader in the church. I remember talking to small group leaders at one point. I said, look, if, if I could boil down the job of the small group leader, it's to celebrate the grace of God at work in the church. That's what a small group does. And if you desire to be a discipler in the church or to disciple other people, which every Christian should desire that at some level, this should be your first ambition, to celebrate the grace of God at work in the life of those believers around you. Fathers, celebrate, be glad at the grace of God. And if you can't see the grace of God, you need to have an eye check because his grace is at work somehow in your children, in your family, in your small group, in your church. This is the foundation of good teaching and discipleship, to see the grace of God and to be glad the grace of God is active, the grace of God is growing, the grace of God is conforming, the grace of God is maturing, the grace of God is warning, the grace of God is protecting, the grace of God is convicting, the grace of God is comforting. It is at work in the church. And Barnabas, as this man who loves to see the grace of God comes, what's the first thing he does? He is glad. What does the church need? teaching that is glad at the grace of God and also teaching that exhorts to faithfulness with steadfast purpose. We need both, don't we? Don't we need both? That's what we should hunger for as Christians. Teaching that is glad at the grace of God and exhorts to steadfast purpose. As Christians, what, what's, what's part of our heritage that we can learn from as we look through this hallowed ground of Antioch, this mighty church. How did they become the church that they were meant to be? Well, they received the encouragement of the grace of God 
and they received exhortation to be steadfast to the Lord. They were not isolated, independent Christians, caretakers of their own teaching. They were recipients of celebration of the grace of God and the motivation to steadfastness. Let me just share a, a, a personal burden. Aaron and I have been talking about this recently, just in our uh, sort of our day and age as a Christian church in America. On the one hand, I'm, it's such a gift of God that in the English language, resources for the Christian church are, frankly, overwhelming, aren't they? I mean, you can type in Christian teaching on YouTube. I mean, you are going to get thousands, hundreds of thousands of hits. Christian books on Amazon. You're going to get thousands and thousands, more than you could ever read. Now, that, on one hand, that, that's, that's marvelous. You think about the, the tribes and various places in the world. They're just thrilled at a few pages of a Bible. And, and we have countless study Bibles we could purchase and books about the Bible and books about the books about the Bible. We have so many resources. We have so many teachers online you can look to. In, in many ways, that's a marvelous thing. And in one way, that's a dangerous thing. We have been burdened recently that the church not assume, Christians not assume that any kind of teaching, because it's called Christian and claims some kind of authority, is safe and healthy for the church. Notice that the church in Jerusalem did not assume that the most passionate, zealous, eager person in Antioch who turned to the Lord should begin teaching and instructing them. They did not assume that this a self-appointed new instructor of the Old Testament in the church in Antioch should begin teaching them. They did not even trust the Christians in Antioch per se to find their own teachers. There, there was this sense of we need trustworthy teaching. Now, now uh, to be careful, I'm not trying to make any claim about myself or Aaron or anything along those lines, but I am making a point about doctrine. Christians need trustworthy doctrine. And there is a lot of untrustworthy doctrine in the avalanche of teaching on YouTube and in Christian bookstores. And I am not talking primarily about explicit heresies. I'm talking about subtle manipulation of God's clear word. Subtle shifts in God's clear word. Please be suspicious of teaching if you don't know the people and the life and the fruit and the background of what their lives are like and who can endorse them. Be suspicious. When I look at a book online on Amazon, one of the first things I look at is who is recommending this book? And I don't care if they're famous. I care if I know them to be trustworthy. I care if I know them to be exegetical. I don't care how many likes a book has. I care who likes it. Be cautious. There was this burden the church in Jerusalem has. Look, if we want this evangelism to actually bear permanent fruit, we have to have a trustworthy teacher. Send Barnabas. He loves the grace of God, and he will exhort them to steadfast purpose in the Lord. And if I may say, I hope, I hope humbly, this is part of the role of the pastoral office. Let, let me encourage you. When you come across a book that looks good, it seems good, the cover, endorsement, so forth, make a practice of asking a trustworthy pastor about his assessment of it. That's the job that Barnabas had in coming to the church to provide sound teaching, sound exhortation, sound celebration of the gospel, to protect the church from being a quick start and a quick scatter. 
I am self-suspicious of myself. I apply this to myself as well. Just this week, I have a sermon to prepare. Next week, there's a conference and so forth. And just this week, I thought, now, I got a lot of books in the library over the years, but I thought, you know, there's this other man, and he knows more than I do about what would be the best resources to study this. So I messaged him and said, what, I, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Is there anything that you think I should be studying as I prepare for this message, as I look at this passage? Look, every, every Christian should have that sense in their heart. Look, I, I want to make sure I'm not all zeal without wise exhortation to steadfast purpose. And I want to make sure that the people that are exhorting me are like Barnabas, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. A good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Not just a skillful teacher, not just a good entertainer, not just articulate, not just great with illustrations, not just readable, but a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. The church desperately needs good men, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and to trust them and to look to them and to see in them the protection and provision of the Lord Jesus Christ so that his church is not quickly started and quickly scattered. I bring this as an encouragement to you because you love God's word. We preach it every week. I was just talking to someone this week about how strange it is to preach from the Bible and have people come the next week. It's very, you're just weird, okay? You're weird Christians. So thank you for loving God's word. Let's stay in that way. Let, let's keep a measure of, of, of suspicion about po kind of popular church Christian teaching. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's sound. Just because a person is famous does not mean they're like Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit, good and full of faith. When Barnabas comes to a church, then, then, the blessing of the Lord is on that church. Notice, a great many people were added to the Lord. And notice Barnabas' disposition. Don't you love this? Barnabas has the endorsement of Jerusalem, but what does he do? He goes to Tarsus in verse 25 to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And what's the result? In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Even Barnabas is not looking to build this church into himself. He says, you know, I know this is, was a radical conversion. It's probably been a number of years. I need to find that guy, Saul. Let's bring him here, the former church hunter. Let's bring, he can help me. We can help each other. There's an accent in Acts and really throughout the New Testament on plurality of pastoring in a church. This is one example where normally churches are, are not led by a single pastor. They're led by a plurality of pastors. That's a consistent pattern throughout the New Testament. And here we have it in Antioch. So he brings Paul because he doesn't want to be the only one teaching either. He needs help. He brings Paul in and here he comes. And what's the result? Their teaching was such that the community connected them most explicitly with Jesus Christ. So much so that their very name took his name. C to be called Christians was, was not some sort of marketing strategy by Peter and, and James in Jerusalem. It was the result, apparently, of such Christ-centered teaching and witnessing and living that there was simply no other thing they could be called. Probably it was a, a mocking epithet to be first called the, you're Christians. You just belong to Jesus. You're, you're people of Christ. And the Christians took that badge proudly and said, yes, we are. So the result of this preaching and teaching ministry and exhortation to remain faithful to the Lord, a celebration of the grace of God for a year, is that the disciples are so identified with Jesus, the culture calls them that in mockery, and they embrace it in honor. And this is our heritage as well. What's a mark of the early church? It was evangelism, witness, yes, conversion, and also teaching, sound teaching, an appetite to learn about Jesus Christ and the word of God, an appetite to be exhorted, an appetite to be encouraged, an appetite to be taught in such a way that Christ becomes more and more their identity. And church, we need that appetite as well. We need that appetite as well. Do we have an appetite to be taught the word of Christ until it is our label? Do we have that appetite? Do 
Do we have an appetite to be taught the word of Christ by sound, faithful teachers and writers and authors until it is our label. I'm against the danger of accepting any and all teaching, but I am for the passionate pursuit of sound preachers like Barnabas and Paul who teach the word of Christ until it becomes our label. We must be devoted to sound teaching. I'd like to invite you also as an application to pray with us that God would raise up people like Barnabas and Paul in our church as well. Not with their authority and uniqueness, obviously, but there's two sides to this story. Antioch received Barnabas, but Jerusalem had to send him. And those of us who have been involved in a church plant know that there are two different ways that are both costly in serving the mission. It's costly to go, and it's costly to send. And we as a church, if we want to fulfill our heritage, our Antiochian heritage, we need to be praying that God would give us the privilege of, of receiving sound teaching and then also of passing this on as well. Just a few chapters, you're going to see that this gift keeps on giving. Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch and Antioch sends him and Paul to the world. There will come a day, brothers and sisters, when a person in our church, I don't know who it is, a man in our church who is full of faith in the Holy Spirit and, and is a good man of integrity and has the anointing to preach, will be raised up among us and sent out to reach a new city with the gospel. And there'll be some of us that are called to go with him. Let's be praying for that. Let's anticipate that. There's going to come a day, by the grace of God, when we will be like Jerusalem and we'll hear that there's a need for gospel teaching somewhere and we'll raise up someone and send them out and that will be costly. And, and if you're here and you're a young man and you feel some stirring of your heart towards pastoral ministry, let me encourage you to seek God and to seek your parents and to seek your small group leader and to talk to people in this church because we would love to see God raise up people like Barnabas that can be sent and received for the maturation of the church. We want this heritage to come to us and be passed down from us. Teaching. Final mark, generosity. Generosity. Look at this final paragraph. Now, in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Generosity. This prophet Agabus is given supernaturally by the Spirit this prediction that the world is going to be suffering by an intense famine, it says, over all the world. And it's important to, to seize a moment, if this is our heritage, if these are our heroes, to seize a moment and stand in front of this placard, as it were, honoring them, and, and to ask, what did they do in that moment? Because there's things they could have done that would have been good things. They could have said, they heard that this prophecy, this famine was going to take place, so the disciples felt exceedingly sorrowful and commented with compassion on the difficulty of their poorer brothers and sisters they would have in the region of Judea. When they, their small groups, they commented together about how challenging it was and they determined to pray. Good thing to do. Good thing to do. But there is a mark of our heritage that we need to receive from these young Christians in Antioch. The disciples determined to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. There's a, there's a wonderful circular 
generosity that takes place in the book of Acts. You also notice it in the book of Philippians as Paul talks about the Philippian church. You notice it when Paul's exhorting the Corinthians. There's this circular giving and interdependence and generosity. So the church in Jerusalem sends beloved Barnabas to the church. They invest and sacrifice him. And then the church in Antioch sends a monetary gift back to the church to support and help because they were poorer, in all likelihood poorer in Judea, and they wanted to support and care for them. We notice this later again with Paul after his missionary travels where he seeks to gather an an offering. So apparently the church in Judea, though large, was not wealthy, was poor, faced significant financial constraints and the church more broadly desired to serve and support them. And this is a part of our heritage. Giving. Generously. And and the focus here is not just on giving to the local church. That's present earlier in Acts. Aaron did a great job preaching about that a couple months ago. But, But it's about giving beyond the borders of the local church. A church needs a vision to not invest all of its resources in itself. A church can be as selfish as an individual can be. A church needs a vision for investing some of its resources outside of itself, for calling for giving outside of itself. A church can become sort of introspective and internal in the same way that a person can. And certainly each of us as individuals should be motivated here because this is money they could have used to save for themselves for the famine. It says over all the world, not just Judea that's going to struggle, they're going to struggle themselves. Their lifestyle is going to have to change. So we have lifestyle-altering Christians desiring to serve other Christians because of their passion for the building and connection of the church. Lifestyle-altering Christians. Because everyone determines according to his ability. That means there's not like this set amount Every person determines, how can I give? How can I be generous? And the church as a whole looks outside of itself and says, we want to be a giving, sending, supporting church. Redemption Hill, it is crucial for us to be a giving, supporting, sending church. It it is crucial for our own longevity as a church. I was talking to a pastor recently who had done a study of giving. You know, a study of churches that give outside of themselves. And, and he made the point, and I won't remember the exact numbers, uh, but it was, it was something like as he studied church after church after church, the churches that survived a certain length of time were the churches that gave outside of themselves. They had a vision for more than themselves. And he said it so motivated him that he immediately determined they were going to establish a consistent missional giving in the regular budget of their church. And we understand this because it's just being biblical. It's just fulfilling our heritage from Antioch to be a church that gives outside of itself, to have individuals in the church that give outside of ourselves, to view our lifestyle as less precious than the progress of the gospel and the building of Christ's church. What is our heritage? It is to view our current lifestyle as less precious than the progress of the gospel and the building of the church. Brothers and sisters, we must view our lifestyle, individually and corporately as a church, as less precious than the building of the church and the advance of the gospel. What does this mean for Antioch? Well, it means that money doesn't go to the newer sound system that they wanted. It means it doesn't go to the support of that additional ministry worker in the church. It means it doesn't go to that nicer thing they needed for their church gathering. It means it doesn't go for their local church ministry outreach. It means some portion doesn't go to that and does go outside their borders to support another church and to care for them in their need. That's a different way of doing church. Now, it is our commitment to you as pastors. Our budget will always include investment outside of our church to the building up and care and planting and support of other churches around this country and around the world. It will always be a part of our budget because if it is not we are falling short of our new testament heritage 
And we will look for moments to call you to be like Antioch as well. To send and give and not hoard and protect, to invest outside of our borders. And if I can speak to you as individuals, if, if you don't give or you give minimally to this church or to the work of the gospel, let me encourage you, study the scriptures and find the joy of fulfilling the heritage of the generous church, which belongs to every Christian. The heritage of a generous church belongs to every Christian, as does the heritage of a teaching church church and the heritage of a witnessing church. And it's worth us asking, is that heritage of our future inspiring us today? I learned about a tradition. I don't think it's actually a law, but a tradition in the military recently. I was watching something. I saw it happen. I looked it up. I'm sure the military among us could, could tell me more about this, but there's a tradition that when a former uh, soldier or current active duty soldier who has won the Medal of Honor is seen, and he has it on his person, so he's presented uniform with the, the soldiers there, tradition would be, will, will snap to attention regardless of rank. So regardless of the man's rank, he might not be even a, an officer, they will snap to attention. So I was, I was watching this in a show, and I thought, that is the coolest thing. That is, I loved watching that. And I thought, you know, isn't there something like that in our hearts when we read about the early church? Spiritually speaking, Shouldn't there be this instantaneous effect on our soul of honor and desire and appreciation and respect to the effect that it changes us? It changes our disposition? It's not just internal. It has an immediate effect on us. I think that's what Antioch, that's what Luke intended it to do. He puts it in front of us as this sort of medal of honor story of the Lord building his church, as the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, as non-Christians are converted, he puts it in front of us and he invites us to draw ourselves to attention and say, here I am, Lord, send me into this purpose as well. The heritage, the heritage of the early church, what's it intending to do? To inspire fresh passion in the building of that church, the proclamation of that gospel today. Let's give ourselves to this heritage, evangelism, sound teaching, generosity. As it were, let us snap to attention as well and throw ourselves into the honor of building the church that was launched in these early days when some suffering Christians went to Antioch, and the Lord's hand was with them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we love hearing how you built your church using ordinary Christians. And Lord, we want to fulfill today the heritage that we receive from Antioch. Lord, we, we want them to be dear to us. We don't know their names, but Lord, we are grateful for them. And Lord, we, we pray that their example would motivate us to long for your hand to be with us as we pursue these things. Lord, move in our church Save the lost who do not know you. Lord, give us an appetite for sound teaching and motivate us to sacrifice our lifestyle for the sake of your mission. Do this among us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.